I'm here today with Andy Stern, formerly the president of the SEIU Union and now at Columbia University. We're here to discuss his new book published by Public Affairs, Raising the Floor. Andy, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Rob. What, what's Raising the Floor? <laughs> raising the Floor is, is a discussion about how technology in the future is really going to have potentially enormous consequences. And that unless we have a floor that everyone can't fall below, there's large consequences I think the country faces. Well, it looks like Trump, Sanders, and others are raising the roof right now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so maybe uh, this is uh, just the kind of medicine we should be approaching. Well, I, I think if you look at what's happening with Trump and Sanders, and to 75% of the American people who are anxious about the future, there's an understanding that no one is talking about, and I mean no one. You know, what's going to happen 10 to 20 years from now if McKinsey's right? 45% of all the tasks in America can be eliminated by technology, or Oxford, 47%, or 3.5 million truck drivers lose their jobs, which is the largest job in 29 states, and repair, and auto parts, and motels. Mm -hmm. No one is really talking about, I think, what people are concerned about, which is, like Buffalo Springfield said, there's something happening here. <laughs> what it is just isn't exactly clear quite yet. And it seems to be focused not so much on globalization, not so much on corrupt politics, but on smarter machines. It's on technology seems to be, which you might call, the daunting element of this area. We go back to 2001, HAL and Space Odyssey. Yeah. But as we're moving forward, these machines are getting smarter. They're doing more, they're winning chess games. And uh, go now and that's right. Jeopardy and everything else. Now I think if you appreciate Moore's Law, you know, which is if you, mm -hmm. for instance, took a grain of rice and put it on the first square of a chessboard and then doubled it and doubled it again, about halfway through you have more rice than, that's higher than Mount Everest. And so the power of doubling is, I think, what we don't quite understand. We think linearly as people, and mm -hmm. as Ray Kurzweil said, we now have to think exponentially. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what that raised floor looks like as a policy. What, what is it that a person receives and what is their responsibility? How does society make it balance? So if we do get to a point, and this is about scenarios, where a lot of things that could be done now, changing the EITC, spending on infrastructure, shortening hours, is not enough, and I don't think it will be mm -hmm. given the speed of technology, then we have to think about what do we do. And there are two issues. One is a work and economic question, which is can we have a floor you know, that raises every American above poverty. We now have 15.6 of Americans in poverty. Our system is not working. And so people are talking about the floor being a universal basic income. Let's take it at $1,000 a month per adult, $12,000 a year for uh, an individual, 24000 for a family of four, and all of a sudden, no one is in poverty in America anymore. And so that is the kind of floor we're talking about as a scenario in case we get to the point there's just not enough jobs for people who want to work. One last thing, then there's a value question. Because if all of a sudden people have more leisure time, and we talked about Maslow and the hierarchy of needs, you know, maybe we could get a little closer to self-actualization. Maybe we could give people more opportunities, you know, rich or poor, to really enjoy and experience life at a different level. So there's an economic question and there's a value question. Yeah. And not being, how would I say, backed up against the threat of starvation or deprivation of your children allows you to be, quote, more free. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I like to say to middle class parents that we have parents' basic income. You know, most middle class parents are there when their kid has a insurance claim and they can't pay for, for their car, they're there to take them on vacation. Mm -hmm. They provide some kind of floor that kids in the middle class know, well, if something really goes bad, I have help. Mm -hmm. But people who are the people I used to represent, janitors and child care and home care workers, they have no floor. Yep. You know, they are desperate. If they miss a day's of work, worth of work, it's their rent or there's food. And, and we can do a lot better by creating a floor that ends poverty. It's really not a new idea at all, mm -hmm. but it's something now that's being talked about, thankfully, around the world. And as you mentioned with the uh, smarter and smarter machines and other things, the number of people who may need that assistance will go up and up and up that the 
service job, what used to be called the middle class jobs, appear to yeah, be we're now, evaporating. This is, yeah, this is now the white collar problem. You know, yes. it's the kids who are graduating Columbia with MBAs who used to go down, for instance, and they worked on the trading floor as traders or they worked as analysts. Those jobs don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, lots of jobs in the healthcare field, radiology or anesthesiology, we now have machines that are able to do those kinds of things. Finance is getting wiped out by algorithms and advanced technology, and so all of a sudden, what used to be a problem for blue-collar workers with globalization or technology, where people used to say, well, they should just get a college degree. Well, talk to the adjunct professors who all have advanced degrees and understand that now technology and uh, having college degrees are not necessarily insulate you from the problems of the economy. Yes. So when we look at this, uh, we see a politics of support at the floor and resource balance. At another level, I see what we might call the Silicon Valley entrepreneur who says, I'll pay that side payment so that people stop resisting my capacity to innovate and therefore make money. Is that a, is that a dynamically stable system in the sense that do we have to have them innovating in order to be willing to make the side payment? Well, or, you know, I, I think we need an economy that can distribute appropriately, yes. you know, whether it's income or assets, because there's plenty around of money mm -hmm. around, it's just mm -hmm. maldistributed. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the attitude that somehow some group of people get to innovate the future and they sort of pay off the bribes to the rest of the country to is a really, a, yeah. Yeah, is yeah. really an American ideal that we should aspire yeah. to. But I do think, you know, people are right that something big is going on. You know, Larry Summers says, you know, in the next generation, a quarter of all working class people will be out of work at any one time. That's a 25% unemployment rate. Yeah. And we don't really have an answer. And there is a distribution problem. And we don't want to stop innovation. Right. You know, but we do want to make sure there's an America that has a little bit more of the kind of values we hope to believe in. And Richard Freeman at Harvard believes that the intervention point might be in ownership shares. If you're going to be replaced by a robot, you get some stock in that robot. Yeah, I think there's a lot of good ideas that people are beginning to come up with. And what's somewhat disturbing is the economists want to decide who's right and who's wrong, where the military wants to decide, <laughs> let's have a scenario in case certain things happen to, a, to yeah. occur. So this debate, which Richard Freeman is talking about, uh, Jason Lanier talks about paying mm -hmm. everybody for their information that is being used by Facebook or Google. Yeah, data taxes. The data tax. I think, yeah. you know, there's lots of good ideas out there. Mm -hmm. The issue is, as a country, we're sort of not getting ready for what may be a, a huge disaster right. that threatens everyone, right. and yet we're not having that debate. Well, essentially, economists talk as though a market metaphorically, will clear and solve all of our needs. What the Pentagon worries about is social instability and whether the structure of employment and compensation and distribution will leave a large portion. Like you said, Larry Summers, 24 percent mm -hmm. unemployed. That's not a happy group. No, and I, I think, you know, more and more in conversations that we probably both have with people who've been very successful are also very worried. A, their children or nieces and nephews are all of a sudden affected by yeah. these changes. B, they appreciate, they've seen around the world when inequality gets too extreme. There's a lot of issues about economic instability. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump is not a happy picture of what happens when people are, are unhappy. Mm -hmm. And we all see, as George Soros and others have talked about, you know, what happens to an open society all of a sudden when there's huge you know, inequality or yeah. discrimination. And I think People understand we're heading in that direction, and the question is, can we begin to make the turn? Yeah. Tell me, what inspired you to go into this? Where, what, where was the, where's the starting point? Where was the inspiration, the aha, and what kind of journey have you been on? So I, I spent 15 years as the president of you know, what was the largest union in the country, the fastest mm -hmm. growing union in the world. Spent every day of my life trying to change other people's lives. And, Despite being what people would say successful, you know, we had grown a couple million people, we had passed a, a health care bill, it just seemed that the future we were not prepared for, that the labor movement wasn't really the answer about economic mm -hmm. equality, 
that a lot of the policies that were going on seemed to miss what I thought were some factors like technology in the economy. So I just had the luxury of going around and talking to Andy Grove and to Dave Cody, the CEO of Honeywell, or, mm -hmm. or Carl Camden, Albert Wenger, people that are investors and, and advocates and workers about what did they see about the future. And I just saw this disconnect. That on one hand, people had this strong feeling that we were at a what Andy Grove would call a strategic inflection point, a turning point for the economy, and where our political system was acting as if you know, this was a Democratic or Republican problem. And by the end of it, I realized that we weren't prepared for major technological change, but I really didn't have an answer of what we could do. And interestingly enough, the research assistant started sending me information. Martin Luther King, in his last book, spoke a lot about yes. hating the welfare system as it currently existed, and why didn't we give people so cash? Book, where do we go from here? Yes, yeah. chaos and community. Yes. And then Charles yes. Murray wrote a book, mm -hmm. you know, that was all about universal basic income. Richard yep. Nixon passed a guaranteed national income through the House of Representatives twice, and it was only because the Senate didn't think it was generous enough. Uh, did, right. Was it not passed, or we would have a very different kind of system? And so it just said to me, we have some interesting ideas. We should begin that debate. And it ended up by saying, why don't I just write a book and tell you what I've thought and what I think some of my ideas. But I don't think I have the only idea. I have one idea of what could be many. The real issue is, can we begin this discussion in our country? Well, I think you're acting as a formidable catalyst, <laughs> and I'm grateful that you're doing so. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for being here today. Appreciate it.